Good evening and welcome to Canton Confidential, the Karen Reed murder trial. I'm Glenn Jones. I'm JC Monahan. We are in the first full week of the murder trial. The jury is almost set. That process will resume on Wednesday. We have new information today, including a potential courtroom change, a fight over a witness sought by the defense, and an update on protests happening outside court. But let's give you a quick recap of how we got to where we are. Karen Reed is accused of hitting her boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe, with her SUV and leaving him for dead in the snow back in 2022. His body was found the next morning outside the Canton home of a fellow police officer, where the couple had been invited to attend a party following a night of bar hopping. Reed is on trial for second-degree murder. Her defense team claims she's being framed by law enforcement. The murder trial started last Tuesday. Jury selection has been happening ever since, and the judge has told jurors the trial will be lengthy, potentially six to eight weeks. Both sides have identified more than 160 potential witnesses, but the prosecution is still waiting for judicial answers about admitting blood and DNA evidence. So let's get to the day's big headlines. We want to send things out to our Kirsten Glavin. She's live in Dedham. Kirsten, another long day of jury selection, and we're not done yet. Yeah, Glenn J.C., 16 jurors are needed, and as of today, 19 have been selected. But the problem here is that several of those jurors are expected to drop out because of several different types of conflicts. Now, jury selection will continue this week on Wednesday with opening remarks potentially starting next Monday. That's one week from today. Day four of jury selection yielding seven additional jurors for the Karen Reed murder trial, bringing the total seated to 19. But due to some jurors expressing hardships of some form, impanelment will continue on Wednesday to get a more solid 16. How difficult has it been to find a jury in this process? It's a normal process. On Monday, out of more than 90 potential jurors, 78 raised their hands saying they've seen, heard, or talked about the case. 32 saying they've formed an opinion and 13 admitting a bias. In a new court filing, the Commonwealth claims Reed's defense team has not made a satisfactory offer of proof as to why Norfolk District Attorney Michael Morrissey should testify in this case. Her team argues his testimony would be about the conflict the Canton Police Department had with the investigation and the assignment of the detective unit of the Massachusetts State Police. Also filed, prosecutors propose moving the trial to a different courtroom. This after Reed's team requested changing the layout, stating some jurors wouldn't be able to see the witness's demeanor and facial expressions. Outside of court, the 200-foot buffer zone for demonstrators still in effect, but the subject of legal contention. And we appealed to the uh, full Supreme Court. The Supreme Court now asking for an expedited briefing of an appeal filed by those wanting to move closer. On Friday, we were informed that uh, they put an order in that they need to get a full briefing by 12 o'clock on Tuesday for an expedited hearing, which means they're taking it seriously. resume on Wednesday of this week with a potential opening remarks start time happening on Monday, one week from today. We're live here in Dedham. I'm Kirsten Glavin, NBC10 Boston. Kirsten Glavin with the day's big developments. Back here in studio, we have legal analyst Michael Coyne and our Sue O'Connor, who's been in the courtroom for jury selection. Let's start there, Sue. More <laughs> jury selection today. I feel like we're in this cycle of taking one step forward and two steps back. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this is the most, as Michael I'm sure knows better than I, this is the most important thing that they're doing to make sure that both sides get a fair trial and are vetting the jury. Uh, we don't get a lot of communication from the judge or the clerk, so we're kind of sitting there in the dark uh, the lights are on, but it's dark, <laughs> and they're talking to these jurors. Um, we have figured out body language-wise when we think that they have accepted someone. So at 1 o'clock, it looked like, wow, they got 16. We've counted them. And then the judge had a little interaction with the counsel, and it was back to calling jurors. And we were like, what the heck is going on here? And then continued on until the last juror, who's always, I don't know if this is always the case, was immediately dismissed, had been sitting there for like six oh, hours, oh. and walks two times Lost this has day. happened. 
Uh, and then we were informed by the clerk they had 19, and defense explained to us uh, why that was. So it was sort of like a never-ending jury pool, and we go back again on Wednesday to pick one more, or maybe more. Who knows? Who knows, yeah. Okay, expecting that some are going to drop out. Can we just talk about district attorney or assistant district attorney Michael Morrissey? They want to call him as a witness. They haven't, what we're hearing the prosecution say is they haven't reached their burden of why. Is that correct? And why would they want him? Generally, that is correct. In order to call the other side's lawyer or counsel for the other side, you have to meet a very high standard because uh, otherwise everyone would try it as a game to really try to disqualify some of the lawyers. So in order to do so, you have to reach a high standard. What they're saying is that it goes to the conflicts within law enforcement and why he assigned the Massachusetts State Police. They can get that through other sources, other witnesses, and the law generally says if you can, then do that through other sources before you actually potentially call the lawyer for the other side. And he is the chief lawyer for the other side. So you wouldn't see more, you don't expect to see Morrissey on the witness stand. I do not. If we did, though, it would be exciting, <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, let's talk about one of the defense motions that we saw last week. It's about the sight lines of the jury. Um, I heard you say it is a, a pretty strong Sixth Amendment argument, and we heard a potential compromise today is just moving to another courtroom. Does that solve um, the, the objection to the sight lines? Yes. Uh, it, as long as the witnesses can see the lawyers, the defendant can see the witness, and most importantly, the jury, right. each juror, can look at the witnesses face to face. Emphasize and, why that's so important, that last part. It's the Sixth Amendment, the right to confront your accuser face to face, to be able to look into their eyes, peer into their soul, and see, in fact, if you think they're telling the truth. Our body language oftentimes conveys an awful lot more information than the words we use. And, and Michael, <laughs> you can see right there, that was one of the views that a juror yeah. would have, which is basically the back yeah. side of a Four head. Four jurors actually would have that Four view. would have that right. view. And yet, this is the first time that we're hearing somebody put an objection to right. it, correct? Yeah. And they've yes. been there 100 years. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Will we ever see another criminal trial in this courtroom with that set up? You, you, not with that set up. Right. You, yeah. I mean, there are ways to fix it. You move the you move where the witness sits is probably the easiest way so that the jury and the defendant and the lawyers can see the witness fully. It's not that complicated of a setup. The problem is we've got very old courtrooms. Uh, they weren't necessarily all built for jury trials. This one would have been. But the fact is, is that for 100 years, we've all lived with it saying, well, this is the setup. We, we, we call it a lousy courtroom, yeah. but it's a really lousy courtroom. <laughs> We're going to talk about the buffer zone. Can we just do this 200 feet out? But they want, the demonstrators want to move mm -hmm. closer, and they've even adopted a color code here so yep. you know who's on what side standing outside the courtroom. Does this change, or are we going to move forward with the 200-foot buffer? I, I mean, I, I think that it's the ACLU is weighing in on this. It's going to be hard to keep people with signs away from the front of the courtroom, I think. I mean, the color is fine um, to express support. But, you know, there have been other protests on the steps of courthouses while courts have... So it's, it's hard to explain what the, the rationale is. It, again, it's another constitutional issue, a First Amendment right for them to be able to protest. But the court has looked at, our court has looked at, and other, the Supreme Court as well has looked at reasonable restrictions on speech. For instance, to protect polling places, you can't get within so many feet of the polling area. Uh, b abortion centers uh, have also been, buffer zones have been acceptable. The, the problem is, is there any other alternative here than the buffer zone of 200 feet? 200 feet is not a small amount uh, of mm -hmm. space. Right. The Supreme Court has looked at our, we had a 35 feet buffer zone with respect to abortion clinics in Massachusetts, and the Supreme Court said that was no not justifiable constitutionally. So mm. it is a tight issue as to whether they'll be allowed to be there, but it's a small courthouse. And it's all around the courthouse, too. It's not just in front of the courthouse. I, we're, I know we're running out of time. Just quickly, how long does that delay the start of this trial, these issues that we just talked about? You know, the, the juror box, who get the witness, the buffer zone. Does that halt? Does Monday seem realistic? Monday seems yeah. very okay. realistic. Okay. We could have start. started today with 19 jurors. I yeah. mean, that's more than enough. And they can start without the buffer zone 
own ruling. Okay, wonderful. Right. Right. And they will. Keep asking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to jury selection tomorrow. Michael Coyne, Sue O'Connell, thank you. All right, jury selection does not resume tomorrow in the murder trial, but the Dedham Courthouse will still be busy. Aiden Kearney, who you may know as Turtle Boy, will be in court for a pretrial hearing. He's facing charges in connection to the Karen Reed case. Let's break that down, or at least try to. Kearney runs the website TV News under the name Turtle Boy. He's blogged about Boston area news for some time, and he rose to a new level of prominence, writing extensively about the Reed case, questioning the investigation. A few weeks back, prosecutors allege Karen Reed was feeding confidential information to Kearney through a third party in an attempt to muddy the murder investigation waters. But his ties to the case go back much farther. Kearney was first arrested in October on multiple counts of witness intimidation and a single count of conspiracy. The conspiracy charges allege Kearney worked with a police dispatcher to intimidate three people, including a state police investigator working on the case. Kearney pleaded not guilty and was ordered to stay away from witnesses. And, Glenn, it doesn't end there. In December, Kearney was indicted on more than a dozen new charges, including eight new counts of witness intimidation, and was sent to jail. That affidavit we mentioned was unsealed in January. It showed nearly 40 hours' worth of alleged communications between Kearney and Reed. The following month, Kearney was released from jail, which you see right here on personal recognizance, but he was hit with two new similar charges. He's remained active online since being released, and again, a pretrial hearing for him is set for tomorrow afternoon. Kearney's attorney has said the blogger is not guilty and vehemently denies the charges, and of course, we'll be sure to bring you the latest on what's happening with this case. We should tell our audience to watch this show with a legal notepad. There is a <laughs> lot to keep track of. We still have a lot to unpack, so make sure NBC10 Boston is your home for the Karen Reed murder trial. Each night at 7, we will highlight the day's big moments, bring you in-depth analysis, and deep dive into the case that has gained national attention. You can also head to our website to share the latest episode of Canton Confidential and find our podcast for staying caught up on the go.